I'm only going to tell you once because I have to by law. I'm a third degree black belt in Okinawa Goju. I'm going to take my right foot, put on the left side of your face. I'm going to break your fucking jaw. And there's not a fucking thing you can do about it. And I get into a stance that's more of a get the fuck out of here stance. And he goes, uh, whoa, whoa, what kind of kung fu do you know? As you can tell by looking at me, you've tuned into Brian Lally, Hollywood Native, and you're about to see another episode of Brian Lally, Hollywood Native. Uh, Scott, my partner Scott Williams is here. You know Scott by now, partner in crime. Scott, who do we have on the show today? Today, Brian, we have a great guest, Tony Montez. Tony Montez. Anthony Tony Montez. Anthony, don't call me Tony Montez, but I do. A son, a father, a veteran an actor, a writer, a director. He teaches all over the world. He has classes in Finland and Berlin and Thailand and Paris. His life is from the Bronx to Long Island to the Navy and then out becoming an actor. So you're going to hear a lot of great stories. So please stick around and watch Tony Montez. There's a quote I love. Um, It says, if you ask me why I came into this world... I am an artist will answer you. I'm here to live out loud by Emil Zola. I'm here to live out loud. Right. You know, and yeah. I wasn't getting the opportunities acting unless I created the opportunities. So I started writing and putting myself out there, you know, because I got something I want to say. Right on. So that's because you were born in the Bronx? I was born in the Bronx, grew up in Long Island. They, they would have pro, uh, programs where they're taking kids out of the Bronx and bringing them to Long Island. I wanted to go to the Bronx. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd have different friends in the Bronx and Long Island. We'd play different games. Long Island, I'd be in the woods. We'd play baseball, football. In the city, I'm playing Johnny and the Pony, kick the can. Stab uh, your friend. Yeah. <laughs> so, Stab yeah. I love the Bronx. <laughs> yeah. Stab your friend yeah. in the eye. Yeah. So, yeah. But I really grew up in the in the in long island yeah my grandparents were in the bronx and you know this what part of the bronx tremont avenue we lived well my grandparents lived by brunkton boulevard um fairmont place was was their street it was right across from uh st thomas aquinas church okay because my mom was in the south bronx she was born in bronx hospital okay 137th brook avenue i guess willis is the the biggest street that ran uh, just was, off of that yeah i was born in mount Eden, and that that church. My mother used to go to the church all the time. Right, mm-hmm. my grandmother. So, growing up, I wasn't sure because I had some cousins in the mafia, and my my mother and grandparents were very religious. Right, I wasn't sure if I wanted to be a priest or in the mafia. Right, you know, when I would go across the street with my grandmother, it felt really great being in the church. You know, it felt closer to God because I can go behind the altar and see what's going on. Right, mm-hmm. but. My cousins seemed to be having more fun. <laughs> so that, so instead of and becoming either, I, I wrote about them. I have a script called The Mobster and the Priest. Right. What's well, Henry Hill's long, as Allah, as, as long as I can remember, as, I've always wanted to be a gangster. Yeah, yeah. And Scorsese says everybody wants to live like a gangster, but nobody wants to die like one. No. So... Unless you don't see it coming, unless you're playing stab your friend. <laughs> yeah. But my mom would go to the, the church, and there was a statue of St. Anthony right to the right. And as a young girl, she would pray to St. Anthony. She wanted to have five kids. She wanted to be boy, girl, boy, girl, girl. That's how we came out. And mm-hmm. um, the first one would be named Anthony, me. And we came out that way. And I only found out last year when my mother passed in June, going through her yearbook, she was known as Tony. Because everyone went to Catholic school, everyone knew of her love for St. Anthony, so everyone called her Tony. Wow. Yeah, and, and I never knew that. Yeah. So. And that's why they wrote West Side Story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All the character Tony. Yeah. So when did you know you wanted to be an actor? So you started acting first. Started acting first. I knew I wanted to be an actor at five. Oh, Jesus. Yeah. You're fucking Pacino. That's why you like Pacino. Oh, yeah. Watch. No, I knew, but. It was all for the wrong reasons. I mean, I would watch movies and I would reenact them with my, there's five of us 
so I would be all the leads. Um, <laughs> I loved Jerry Lewis and Dean Martin. Sure. So I'd watch with my brother Michael, and I would be, i say, okay, I'm Jerry Lewis. And then I'd switch at the part where Dean Martin got the girl. It's okay, now I'm Dean Martin. <laughs> and then I'd switch back after that. Yeah. So I, I guess I wanted to be the funny guy who got the girl. Um, but I say the wrong reasons because I wanted to be anybody but myself. Right. You know, because I had a tough relationship with my father. And he convinced me that I was unlovable, I was a piece of shit, so I thought, there's got to be something wrong with me. So I, I definitely don't want to be me. So I thought acting meant becoming someone else. It wasn't right. until I was older that I realized, oh, shit, I'm not putting a mask on, I'm taking a mask off. Right. And I'm really discovering through art who I am. Right. So did you start in school plays? Well, I wanted to. <laughs> I told my father in junior high that I think I want to be part of the drama department and he said what are you a faggot mm. so that killed that mm -hmm. so i wrestled so my father seeing his son in tights hugging other guys was more masculine to him than being an actor yeah and then when i was an, an adult and i said i want to be an actor he says well, it's because you're lazy you don't want to work Jeez. Yeah. so i couldn't live in that house so at 17 i joined the navy um to get out of the house and when i got out of the navy i started going to hp studios when I was 11, 12, I did a motorcycle Yamaha magazine ad, and then I did a Carnation Instant Breakfast commercial. And my dad was an actor, and I just loved it. Mm -hmm. I was a very troubled youth, but I loved being on the set. We had so much fun, and I got paid. Yeah. I was 12. Yeah. And my dad said, never again, no child actors in this family. Oh, really? Yeah. So anything I seems I wanted to do, I couldn't do. So it's it's tough. So then you so you started going to HB Studios right out of the. Did, did you have a GI Bill or or something? Or I did have the GI Bill and I wasted it. I mean, oh. I you know I was Hookers. troubled, <clears throat> huh? Hookers. Well, that too. <laughs> but well, I wanted to get away from my father. Right? I didn't want to be told what to do. I didn't like being talked to. You right. couldn't call me stupid. That was fighting words. And now right. I had everybody telling me what to do right. in the Navy. Right. So I was always in trouble. Like I got out with an honorable discharge, but I, you know, I got deported. I got five captains masked. Um, I had Cinderella Liberty in, in uh, Genoa. Um, I was always in trouble. In fact, when my everything my recruiter told me was a lie. Well, hey, let's go back. You have five <clears throat> captain. I don't even know what that is. So oh, it's you're... like going to court in the navy. Right, like a court martial. Well, I didn't get court martialed. You got to go in front of the captain, and it's a trial, and then they 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 give you a punishment. My first one. Um, hey, Chef, you're on a uh, you're on speaker, and you're on the podcast. Really? <laughs> <laughs> but the classic dramatic pause. Yeah, Tony Montez was just telling something really deep about his life. But yeah, I decided to pick up the phone because it was you. Uh, well, you shouldn't do that. I just had a good question. I'm working. I had a work question for you, so I will. Uh, mm -hmm. Let you get back to your podcast and give me a call when you have a minute. Okay. All right. This didn't turn out as funny as I was hoping it would. <laughs> yeah, I'm not uh, good. Uh, <clears throat> I were not married. Is that funny? Yeah. <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs> so when I went. It's usually a funny interlude. Oh. It wasn't today. No. Well, you don't know unless you try, right? No. So I, I go in the Navy, right? It's October 29th. Every, every, well, I won't go into the Navy because that's a, a lot of stories, but everything my recruiter told me was a lie. Um, because I went in October 29th, they let us go home for Christmas, and I won't go into everything, but everything was going wrong. And they said, no tattoos, no piercings. So I went and got a tattoo and pierced my ear, <laughs> figuring they're going to see this is not a good fit. And <laughs> So after that, I went to Radio Manet School in Bainbridge, Maryland. They never gave me my passport. I was going to go meet my ship. I got in a fight. That was Oh, that was my first captain's mess. I got a fight in a fight in uh, Bainbridge. So I got delayed a month. So I missed my ship. My ship pulled out. So now they're going to fly me to the Middle East to meet my ship in Bahrain. I never received my passport. So I called them up. I said, I don't have a passport. And they said, well, go with your orders and your ID card. You should be fine. Go in your uniform. I don't like my uniform. And I miss read my instructions, I thought it was going to be stationed in my rain. And I looked it up in encyclopedia and there's nothing there. My parents take me, my family, we all go to the airport. I think I'm not going to, this is my last chance to maybe meet a girl on the plane. I'm not going to, 
go in my uniform, I throw my uniform in the sea bag and dress in my jeans and civilian clothes. My mother says, what are you doing? I said, no, they said it's optional. <laughs> <laughs> I, I could dress the way I want to dress. Yeah. Uh, Say goodbye, I land in Leonardo da Vinci Airport in Rome, no problems. Then I get on Middle Eastern Airlines, nobody speaks English. There were a lot of hijackings during that period, and all of a sudden we're landing away from the airport, and I see tanks, soldiers board the plane, and we got to get on a, on a tram to go to the airport. And I can't ask anybody what's going on. I think, oh, shit, we must be in Cuba. Got hijacked. Yeah, yeah. So we pull into the tram, and I see a U.S. Marine, I says, what happened? Is this Cuba? Are we hijacked? He goes, no, you're in, you're in um, uh, Beirut. They're having a lot of problems here. Don't worry, they're just going to ask for your passport. It'll take about an hour and get back on the plane. I said, I don't have my passport. I said, how'd you get make it this far? I said, nobody asked. <laughs> you know, this was all before 9-11. It was a lot easier. Yeah. He says, well, just go in the bathroom in one of the stalls. When they're done asking, um, I'll come knock on the door, just get back in line, and maybe you get back on. I'm in the stall, people trying to get in. I'm like... Uh, you know, occupado, you know. <laughs> he not bangs about an hour later. I get back on the plane. Everything's cool. I'm in Bahrain now. I'm going to pick up my my luggage, and I get stopped by a guy with a machine gun. They want to see. Yeah, I had to get a bunch of shots before I left. He don't speak English. I get somebody who speaks English. They want to see my shot card. I can't open my orders because I also have a top secret clearance. I'm gonna be. I'm going to a spy ship. I can't show it to him. So they want to take me away. So where am I going? They said, well, you got to get certain shots. I said, I'm going to get them more needles. I open it up, give them the shot card. The executive war officer comes. They don't want to let me on the ship. They want to deport me all these back to the United States. I'm 17. They agree to send me back to the nearest American embassy. They send me back to Lebanon. They're going to send me back in the morning. They won't put me up in a hotel. I got to stay in the uh, airport. I take my wallet, stick it in front of my pla my pants, and I'm starting to go to sleep. And I hear this giggling. And I look up, and there's these three women in black, and all I see is their eyes. And I should be studying about this. I don't know what's going on. And they're laughing, they're giggling. And I thought they were lepers. And that's why they were all covered, and I can only see their eyes. And I, I said, shoot, get away, get away. And now... I'm thinking, oh, my God, they touched me. They got leprosy all over me, and there's nobody I can ask about this. I get picked up by a limousine the next morning uh, in Lebanon, and I, I'm trying to explain to the driver, I'm not sure if these women were lepers, but they touched me. They were giggling, and he don't understand what I'm talking about. <laughs> Takes me back to the embassy, and I'm, I'm asking him about the lepers, and I said, no, they're not lepers. <laughs> they wear a burqa. That's how they, they dress. I meet the ambassador. They fly me back. It's about 1 o'clock in the morning. We leave for Masawa, Ethiopia, and I can't do anything but throw up. I'm sick. So that becomes my second captain's mask because all I'm doing is throwing up. I can't you go down below, and I'm so seasick. And somebody's told me what to do. I told him to go fuck himself, and then that was my second captain's mask. But I won't go into it because I got a million Navy stories. Right. Right. So you get But I went in the Navy to get away from my father. I did come out. I did get the GI Bill. Turns out, you know, I just went yesterday for a colonoscopy and an endoscopy and I'm covered because of because I was in the Navy. Right. I got you coming and going on that. You got me coming and going, yeah. I took him to his colonoscopy. <laughs> wow. I'm sure glad that came out. Yeah. Well, wow. I don't want to be the only one. I don't even know what I'm talking about. It. I would never say anything about it. Today, Yesterday, I'm uh, telling everybody about it. Tonight on the colonoscopy show, yeah. we have Anthony and Brian yeah. discussing what it's like. I'm yeah. looking forward to, to mine. Middle yeah. age. Well, I may not have to worry about the next one because they said you know, I don't have to come back for another 10 years. Yeah. So I'm 66, 76. It's like... Hopefully, I don't, I don't see you guys. In 10 yeah, years. they told me that 10 years, and then Blue Shield sent me something that said they'd pay for it, and I went in. Not because I wanted it. I'm not waiting. Yeah, you know, you yeah. see all these people, all these rich fucking actors die. Yeah, yeah. Prostate cast, yeah. cancer. They got 20 mil in the bank, and they're not going down to get a test. Yeah. And it happens all the time. Yeah. And they got money. They got, they got coverage. And they go and they die. You hear that? Oh, yeah, had advanced colon cancer. Yeah. Where's the fucking uh, you know exam? What, yeah. what are you doing? I mean, so look, 
Shout out I mean, to colonoscopy. Shout, shout out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, Run the clip. Yeah. 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 You know what? <laughs> the people said, what are you doing? I told them I needed more footage for my reel. Yeah. <laughs> so they give me all the there pictures. So I got, it's yeah. like, you know, yeah. fantastic. Yeah. yeah, I got the pictures oh, all the way up. And yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so they give me the, the yeah. pictures. It's like, what, what am I supposed to do with right. this? Did you see Uncut Gems? Yeah, the, the yeah, 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 yeah. Starts yeah. with the colonoscopy. Yeah. Nice. So, yeah, yeah so I didn't see it. No, no. Uh, but then after I got out of the navy, then I really started doing what I wanted to do. So, so to study acting. So you're back on Long Island. You went back there because so I went back there because I didn't know. You know. It was only I got out before I turned 21, and the rest of my time was reserve time, uh, where you go to meetings, uh, and then two weeks in the summer. And I didn't. That's a whole nother story, but. <laughs> I won't go into that. I ended up being AWOL because it was another lie and I just didn't go. And a year and a half later, I got put back in the Navy. The FBI and the Naval Investigating Service came looking for me, went to my job, to my, saw my mother, and I had to go back in the Navy for a month. And that's another Dang. story. But by that time, did I, you, I grew my hair apartment? out. Did you apartment? Did you lose your apartment? Uh, no, I was, uh, I was living with my friends. We went seeing Pacino at Hofstra and he kept referring to himself as we are the stuff. You know, we are the stuff that dreams are made of. And it was after uh, um, John Casale had passed away. Yeah. And a bunch of us lived in the house. And one of the friends was good woodwork. And we called it the stuff house. We were, we thought we, we really thought we were the shit because it was during, you know, the, the whole 2001 period, you know, the yeah. Saturday Night Live. We, we were those characters. Yeah. So early on in my acting, as much as I loved acting, I had a lot of demons you know me and my friend jd we picked the acting classes by whichever ones had the most girls in it it was oh, yeah. like you know this one's got 12 this one's got two let's let's, we, let's we gotta, go to this we one put in a picture i got a picture of me in the white uh in the white suit the white suit yeah i got a picture we gotta we gotta insert that yeah so yeah you were at the 2001 me too yeah and then we're gonna cut it, to cut to that yeah I, I probably have pictures too of me in the suit and the hair yeah <laughs> you know i wanted long hair that i could just go like this yeah. mm -hmm. and it didn't grow that way and when i was 16 i had it straightened <laughs> yeah i wanted that i had enough to get it straightened but not enough to get it styled so i look like i just walked out of a kung fu movie <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah. but if i sneezed my hair was like Shh. yeah <laughs> but i thought you know not knowing much about acting i thought i was natural Lead talented, I thought, and I just took scene study classes. I didn't know really. I knew about technique. Where'd you take those at? HB Studios. Oh, you went to HB, so that's yeah. where you, you started. Now, did you study with Uta Hagen? No, and I was going to study with her. I had interviewed and everything. I was going to study with her, but then another chapter of my life took me a different direction. So when I was 27, very depressed, working three jobs just to pay my rent. Um, my father had convinced me I was a piece of shit and I was unlovable and all my friends were hooking up with their girlfriends for the 4th of July weekend. Right. And I just got done working at Nia's catering house and leaving a bar and in the elevator and saw the train coming and I jumped. I just had my father's voice in my head and I just wanted to silence it. And I jumped and hit the tracks and my bag dropped down to the street and now the train was coming. And I thought... I had seconds to think, do I hang and maybe try to pull myself off? I couldn't remember where the third rail was and I had no time to think. So I jumped to the my left and was able to grab onto a fence and pull in. Train came by, clipped me in the arm, fractured my arm. And um, so after that... You immediately regretted it when you hit the... Well, as soon as I hit the tracks, I thought of my mom. And I mm -hmm. thought, I can't do that to her. You yeah. know, was she going to... And here, here, this tell you everything you need to know about my father. Man, Brian, you know what I love doing? Yeah. I love tapping that subscribe button. Mmm. I love it too, son. And just like all your dates, I tap it last. But nothing's as good as tapping this button. You see Brian here? He's not always doing the best. Financially, mentally, physically, for sure. You want to help keep Brian off the streets of Hollywood? There's a way you can help. Join us on Patreon. You want to tell him what we got on there, buddy? Yes, we have the general admission. We have the backstage. 
and we have the VIP All Access Pass. So please join today. I'm due for a bath. In the arms of <laughs> angel, at um, a certain point, they took me to Elmhurst Hospital, and then somebody had to pick me up. So there's a real bitchy nurse saying, so you got to call somebody. So I had to use the phone booth, and I it was there, and I, I called. It was 3 o'clock in the morning, 3.30, and my mom picks up. I said, Ma, and she goes, Anthony, what's wrong? And then I lost it. I couldn't talk. So I gave the phone to the nurse, and she said, uh, Anthony was hit by a train. You have to come to Elmhurst Hospital and pick him up, and she hangs up. And I'm like, how do you tell my mother I was hit by a train? What, what must she be thinking? Mm -hmm. So I call her back, and I said, Mom, I'm okay. I didn't find out two years later because she came to get me. She had woke up my father and said, you know, we got to go to Elmhurst Hospital. Anthony's been hit by a train. And my father says, you go. You know, so. Jeez. You know, you're a father. Were they together until yeah. he passed? Yeah. And oh. they, they would be. My mother was. A Catholic. Know, yeah. And, yeah. you know, she's like, there's a Spoon River, uh, Mrs. Perkopile, that reminds me of my mom. Yeah. You know, that, you know, she saw it as a vow. And her uh, relationship with my father was going to be a lifetime, but her relationship with God was eternal. And My mother had been divorced, so my father's parents were from Ireland, so he was Catholic, Catholic, and mm -hmm. he married a divorced woman, so he couldn't receive the sacraments, but he went to church. Yeah. He took the collection. My mom didn't go. I think she'd had a bad experience in life. Um, but, yeah, they, they were together. They fought. They fought over me. But... Yeah. So, and then that's what brought me to LA. Oh, was, right after that? Maybe a couple of months after that, I was living yeah. in Brooklyn Heights with we, with some roommates. So my view at the promenade was to the left was the uh, the Statue of Liberty, Twin Towers right across right. Brooklyn Bridge, and then the Empire State Building. Okay. And I was working midnight to eight. In the Navy, I was a teletype operator. Uh, I was a radio man, so I used a teletype. So I had got a job at Bank of America midnight to eight and i thought it'd give me more time to audition right but i couldn't even take the subway so i would walk every day across the brooklyn bridge down it was right by the twin towers i love that walk yeah i loved it i love the brooklyn bridge day. i loved it as a tourist well i like walking and i, I love being outside but it was there's no way it can exist in new york a week after i did what i did a guy had jumped on the train to help a homeless guy and he was not able to squeeze in like I was. He was a bigger guy, and the train took him and tore him up and killed him. Mm. And the homeless guy lost his legs. And I didn't realize it until, you know, maybe 21 years ago that I think I had a form of survivor's guilt, you know, that I went through my life thinking, you know, because I didn't know anyone who worked harder at their acting who had less opportunity or get right there and, and it would be yanked away. And I thought, I rationalized to myself, I think I'm paying back a comic debt for what I did. I don't know how long I got to pay back this debt, but I think that's what it is. And I had convinced myself of that. So I think that preceded me in life, you know? Right. I mean, I never loved anything as much and wanted anything as much, so I just kept doing it. And even if it meant, you know, just doing it in a black box theater for five people, I was going to yeah. do it. And, it. and I love it. Now, when you were studying it. HB, were you able to do any theater? No, and I finally had gotten cast in something where I would have gotten my SAG card in uh, New York, but the, the, the project kept getting delayed and delayed and didn't look like it was ever going to happen. Right. I almost got my SAG card on Tootsie. Oh, okay. But that's a whole other story, and my friend you J.D.'s fit, involved. You couldn't fit the skirt? Yeah, no. <laughs> it, it, it's, a, it's, it's a funny story, but... So yeah, we don't want that. Yeah, yeah. Let's not start with funny stories. Well, I'm, I'm we, sitting. I want, I want suicide. <laughs> yeah. All right, let me, and, oh, yeah, yeah. Me. And get right. colonoscopies and getting that's thrown. True, that's true. That's true. That's true. So anything that I, goes I get, in the, the I, uh, way of humor. So um, we're at the West Bank Cafe. Me and my friend JD, right? And we we go there and we start talking to this guy at the end of the bar, and he tells us he's George Steinbrenner's chauffeur. He and what do you guys do? We were actors. He goes, well, they're shooting something right down the street. We should just go there. Six o'clock in the morning. York, but I love that. What do you do? I'm yeah. an actor. Yeah, hey, yeah. They're shooting down there. Why don't you just go get yeah. a job? Yeah. And it sounded good to us, right? He says, when you get down there, tell him Sylvia Face sent you. Hang on, my buddy, Paulo. I don't know if you ever knew Paulo Romanacci. Mm -hmm. He's from uh, East Haven, Connecticut. At the time, 
most Italians per capita outside of okay. um, Italy. His parents are from Italy. So uh, River Phoenix dies, uh-huh. unfortunately, in front of the uh, Viper Room. And his dad calls up and he says, uh, he says, uh, Paolo, he says, Paolo, uh, that, that young guy uh, passed away. And he goes, yeah, yeah, it's pretty bad. He goes, what do you think? He's like, what do you mean, what do I think? He said, well, they need someone to replace him. Oh, shit. <laughs> wow. He's like that. I, yeah, yeah. Well, I don't know. Go see. You're a good looking kid. You know, you. Yeah. Go see. No. Yeah. No, that's this, that's this town. So, did that lead to, did you go down there to try to get it? So, involved? I say, I'm going to go. And JD says, you know, we don't know if that anything's going to come from it. I don't know what the, what the movie is at this time. And I wouldn't have known at the time either what it was. Right. I said, well, I'm going to go down. And Jimmy and I go into HP Studios together, and we're both working on Half Full of Rain, so I take my play with me. And as I walk in, the security guard gets called away. And this woman with a clipboard comes walking up. She goes, can I help you? I said, uh, Sylvia Faye sent me. She goes, oh, come on in. We've been waiting for you. So I walk in. She says, you can go have breakfast. You can sit here. You're, you're third to go into makeup. You're going to be the cameraman. Um, they may give you uh, a line. You okay with that? I'm like, yeah. I'm okay with that. Dabney Coleman comes over. He introduces himself to me. <laughs> he says, I'm saying, I'm Anthony. I'm, I'm Dabney. Did you get something to eat? And I'm nervous anyway, so my stomach's in a knot, so I'm not eating nothing. Mm-hmm. I'm not having no coffee. I said, no, I'm, I'm cool. So I think, I'm going to call Jimmy down. This was so easy. So I call him down. I said, Jimmy, I'm going to be the cameraman on this movie. They said they're going to give me a line. He goes, all right, I'll come down. I'm sitting there for... You know, the next guy goes into the makeup. There's two people and then me. And this guy comes in. And the one with the clipboard says, can I help you? He goes, yeah, Sylvia Faye sent me. She goes, oh, that's strange. Sylvia sending two of you. We only needed one, but that's okay. We'll find something for you. And I'm thinking, oh, shit. Jimmy's coming down. This is going to be fucked up. (laughs) Dabney Coleman comes by again. Tony, you get something to eat? I said, no, I'm good. (laughs) I'm fine. I'm now one more person before I go in, and then the guy who's really supposed to be there sitting next to me, my friend Jimmy comes whistling down. <laughs> He's got a half full of raid in his pocket. He's all dressed in black. The woman with the clipboard comes over and to him and says, um, can I help you? He goes, yeah, uh, Sylvia Faye sent me. She goes, didn't Sylvia tell you you never wear black or white? He goes, no, no, nobody told me nothing. Yeah. <laughs> he goes, who did you talk to there? He goes, uh, Mark? She goes, uh, have a seat. And she goes into the room, and I go, oh, shit. So Jimmy go, starts talking. I said, he goes, Daddy, what's going on? I said, don't talk to me. <laughs> he, goes, he goes, what? I said, don't talk to me. <laughs> so I'm reading my play, and he's reading his play. We're reading the same play. You denied him now I'm times next. before the rooster Yeah, road. exactly. This is the right weekend for it. I'm ready next to go into makeup. I see the security guard come walk into the office, and I say, Jimmy, let's go. He goes, I just got here. I said, let's go. He goes, why? I said, I'll tell you. So we start walking, and the woman comes out. She goes, "Uh, Tony. And I turn around. She goes, Sylvia didn't send you, did she? I said, no. He said, uh, she said, I'm I'm sorry. We're not going to be able to use you. And we're walking out, and Jimmy goes, what happened? I said, don't talk to me. (laughs) Don't talk to me. And the movie turns out to be Tootsie. Right. Wow. Yeah. So... That was the start of my, you know, getting close yeah, to things and right things there. not happening. Yeah. Um, that happened to me on The Godfather. On The Godfather? <laughs> no. No. <laughs> yeah, so then Jimmy was in uh, Vegas, and his relationship with his girl was breaking up. We knew a friend in L.A. Things weren't working out for me in New York. I had to get out of there. My friend Jack says, at that time, they had a screen extras union. Yeah. Yeah. He said, I can get you guys into the screen extras union, and, and from there you can get into SAG. Come out and stay here. So we did. We went out and stayed with him. And then Jimmy and I got a a, a place ourselves. We never did get into the Screen Extras Union, but we started doing a lot of Screen extra Extras work. Union was started by a man named Lally. Was it? Yeah. Did you do it? No, Were you no, part no, of it? Was, no, no. I was a friend of uh, a guy I'm fa- friends with on Facebook, though we talked when he was here. He's an actor, poet, writer, mm-hmm. quite a bit older than I am. But we met 25, 30 years ago. Uh, he heard my name over the loudspeaker. I was selling cars, and he came looking for me because Lally's a very unusual name, yeah. even in most of Ireland. 
And he tracked me down. We talked and said, he said, well, related somewhere, you know, so few of us. And he told me his dad started the, uh, his name's Michael Lally. He said his dad started the uh, Extras Union. Wow. So it's pretty cool. No, it's, it's very cool. And then that's where we, where we started. I started um, doing extra work. Right. We had this friend. I don't know why we called him the Schoon Jill, but we called him Schoon Jill, Gary McAvoy. And he was like six foot three. And he introduced us to uh, this place called the China Trader. Did you ever go there? The China Trader? Yeah, on Riverside? Yeah, it's, yeah. it's where Gary Marshall's place is now. Well, that China Trader was on the corner where the cleaners is now, but I know what you're yeah, saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. I'm sorry. By uh, the coffee spot? Yeah, yeah Priscilla's. By Priscilla's. By yeah. Priscilla's. Yeah, 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 that's the cleaners, yeah. Gotcha. I don't mean to be specific about, you know. No, 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 that's that's, a, LA, that's okay. But, you know, you might, I don't know if you know this, but I'm a yeah, Hollywood native. <laughs> so. No, in, in those days, we, uh, I, I, I told you I had demons. So yeah. I was drinking too much and smoking too much. And he says, um, meet me at China Trader. Right. So Jimmy and I, he, and he had given us some hash beforehand. So we smoked that and we go in. We see Gary in the middle of the dance floor. And he looks like, it's like, what is he doing? It's like just out there dancing by himself. <clears throat> and there's all these tables. As we are closer, he was in a sea of little people. <laughs> they were filming, I think, Under the Rainbow oh, at Warner Brothers. So yeah. all these little people came over to the China Trader after work. I, I never saw so many little people in one place. And it was stoned, so the whole thing is kind of surreal. Yeah. I sit down, and Jimmy sits down, and this little woman comes over to me and asks me if I want to dance. And I say, and I don't dance. And I said, no, I, I don't dance. And Jimmy's busted my chops and said, Tony, you were just saying how much you were looking forward to dancing. <laughs> yeah. What kind I, of I, Italian Puerto yeah, Rican are you? You yeah, don't dance. Yeah, I said, I really don't dance. So I, I said, I'm, I'm just going to go get myself something to drink. Now it's starting to get crowded. I'm at the bar. I just pay for it. And this guy bunks me and the beer spills. And I just see him kind of as he's sitting down, him and his girlfriend. So I say, you say, excuse me. And the guy looks at me and goes, fuck you. I said, fuck me, fuck you. He goes, you want to go outside? I said, yeah, I'll go outside with you. I got to preface it by... You may have heard this story because I, I, I wrote it, it in, in, yeah, in James' I heard class. It, yeah, in the class that Franco and I were teaching. Yeah. yeah. So I had watched and I had seen it many times, Billy Jack, and it had been on that week. And whenever Billy Jack is on, I always watch it, right? So I go, I'll, I'll go outside with you. Well, the guy stands up and he just keeps standing. He's like <laughs> 6'3", and his girlfriend the whole time is like, come on, don't go. He goes, no, this New York is a tough guy. Let's go outside. So I'm walking outside thinking, oh, my God, I'm going to get the shit kicked out of me. And meanwhile... My friend and, and JD and Gary are out there dancing, and they don't even know I'm in trouble. <laughs> so I get out there, and I'm thinking, okay, I got one move. So I take off my shoes, and I turn to the guy, and I say, listen, I'm only going to tell you once because I have to by law. I'm a third-degree black belt in Okinawa Goju. I'm going to take my right foot, but on the left side of your face, I'm going to break your fucking jaw, and there's not a fucking thing you can do about it. And I get into a stance that's more of a get-the-fuck-out-of-here stance, and he goes, uh, Whoa, 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 what kind of kung fu do you know? I said, don't make like you didn't fucking hear me. I'm a third degree black belt in Okanagan Jew. I'm going to take my right foot, put it on the left side of your jaw. I'm going to break your fucking jaw, and there's not a fucking thing you can do about it. And he goes, all right, well, let's not fight here. It's by the entrance. I said, wherever you want. And as we're walking, I'm walking through the parking lot, and I'm stepping over pebbles into myself. I'm like, ouch, ouch, ouch. <laughs> right? But I'm not showing ouch, ouch, ouch. Right. right? And... His friends now come out of the back of the bar, and there's two, two more of them. And he says, you've got to be kill kidding me. Three of you? This is going to be fucking fun. But the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take my right foot, put it on the left side of your face, and I'm going to break your fucking jaw, and there's not a fucking thing you can do about it. And the girlfriend's trying to pull him away, and now my, my stance is really a, i got to get the fuck out of here stance. Yeah, but by this time, the bouncers come out, and they, they, they say, all right, all right, let's break it up. You know, and the big guy says, well, he started it. And the bouncer says, he started it. <laughs> it's just one of him and three of you. And, yeah. and he, the girlfriend says, let's just go. And he goes, ah, fuck this place. And he leaves. And I'm going back to get my shoes. And I'm like, ouch, ouch, ouch. Put my, my sneakers on. And the bouncer says, I overheard you. I saw the martial arts. What kind of kung fu do you know? I said, I don't know any kung fu. I watched Billy Jack this week. <laughs> and he goes, holy shit. And he starts calling me killer. <laughs> He pays for my drinks. He pays for my dinner. I never have to wait online, never have to pay to come in. He always buys me my first drink, and he, he calls me killer. You That's know what crazy. I'm saying? I always say, you guys want to go one at a time or all at once? 
<laughs> one at a time is less embarrassing. <laughs> I'm glad I haven't been in that position <laughs> anymore. But it was it, during that time I met. Did you know Nora? Nora. Um, I don't know her name, but she was. Nora. Dye? She no. Just she was. She was part of Playhouse with uh, Bob and. Um, no. Who was, now his name just went out of my head. Who was the guy that was with him at the time? Glenn? Glenn. Glenn Vincent? Yeah, with Glenn Vincent. He was the best beginning teacher I ever had. Yeah, no, I love Glenn. He, he, he was really specific. Yeah. And you knew every time you went in front of Glenn, mm. you are going to have to tell him your reason. Yeah. Every time. Yeah. It doesn't matter if you broke down, threw shit, people got killed. Yeah. He'd be like, what'd you come for? Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, and he was very soft-spoken. Right? Yeah. 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 He's so, in New Jersey now. Yeah. He's still yeah, teaching. Yeah. yeah. Seen him. I support him. Good guy. And um, it was funny because I thought the technique that I would study would be Strasbourg because I love Pacino. So I had gone and sat in with JD on a Strasbourg class. On Santa Monica Boulevard, that one? Has it been here that long? Santa yeah, Monica yeah, yeah. By the 7 Eleven? Yeah. The Strasbourg Institute. Hey, and it was a sense memory exercise. And out of context to me, it looked like an insane asylum. And then I went and sat in on uh, Playhouse West, and I thought, oh, this looks like a real step backwards. I have no idea what this repetition thing is about, but I'm doing scene study. You mm -hmm. know, I don't want to stop back. But lucky enough, they were doing scenes the next time I went, and it, there was something about it. Everyone seemed to be real. Everyone seemed to be really listening. Everyone seemed to really be talking to each other, and everyone in that class seemed passionate wanted to be there so i joined with jd but he quit right away and and i stayed and and i went at one point three times a week because i would go to with bob to 20th century fox and work with students there mm -hmm. and i loved it i loved it and it was life changing um he's he's you know maybe i think a better listener um a better communicator um better active better person yeah, mm -hmm. and that was on Lancashire, right? They already yeah, had, that was already a, had the I, I was part of helping build it. Is uh, your name on the back plot yeah, there, yeah. Adam Small? Yeah. yeah. Well, John Sheeran designed it, and he right. he did it. Okay. Mostly, but me, Sam Whipple. Yeah. You know, uh, Delia. That's a fucking Gerald shame, Sam Whipple. Yeah. 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 He's one of the only guys I know in life. I mean, there's there's some greats, you know, comedy greats: Will Ferrell, Steve mm -hmm. Carell, yeah, Jim Carrey, of course. Mm -hmm. But working with Sam on plays and stuff, he was one of those yeah. only guys that could try to be funny and be funny. Yeah. You know, he wasn't forcing it. He was just fucking funny. No. And yeah. then that unbelievable emotion he has in The Rock. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. They pull him out. They're going to shoot him in the back of the yeah. head. He's, oh, my God. He's, uh, he did some great work, man. He did some great. Did he have prostate cancer? Not he had a cancer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Back to the. But he was, he passed really young. Yeah. I think it was in his thirties. Yeah, Sam was. He was a surfer. He was a lifelong. He was from Venice. He was a skinny dude, but he was he was a Venice local, so he was nuts. Sam Whipple would get a check. He'd get an acting gig, like on The Rock, a big production, or The Doors, or something. He'd get a good check, and he'd get on the plane to Bali. Yeah, that's what he'd do. Every check he got. He'd get on a plane, Hawaii, Bali. He'd just, just take his money and go surfing. Yeah. So he was a good dude, man. No, he was a really good guy. He, yeah. You know, he did, I think Goldblum directed that short that sure. they did and was yeah. nominated for an Little Oscar. Little surprises. Yeah. 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 Nominated for the Academy Award. Yeah. Yeah. I got to meet Rod Steiger, hang out with him a little bit. Oh, nice. So, yeah, because nice. nice. at the time, he was able to ask someone to go on, like, be his valet, because at the time he couldn't, like, tie his right, own shoes. Right. And he was in a wheel. Not a, he wasn't always in a wheelchair, but going through airports mm -hmm. and stuff. And so Kenny Moscow went with him at one time. So I took Kenny to meet him, mm -hmm. and I got to talk to him a bit. And uh, Steiger spoke at Playhouse, you know, mm -hmm. one time. And instead of going to see Steiger, which I wanted to, it was my son's birthday party, and Steiger said, at the, while he was speaking, if I had it to do over again, I'd spend more time with my family. I had to make a decision. It was kind yeah, of yeah. like fourth birthday party. Mm -hmm. And uh, we just did that in unison. Yeah, we did. Too. So, uh, what are you doing? <laughs> what are you doing? Oh. <laughs> yeah. Damn. Like, I got my hand up your ass. <laughs> so, and Stagger told a story about Brando, mm -hmm. you know, leaving the cab and on the waterfront. Oh, As wow. a matter of fact, the cab driver, Nehemiah Persoff, died last week. 
a week before. Mm-hmm. And uh, he was a good friend of my father's, Nicky Persoff. But he, uh, but Brando, you know, left the cab and he said to Steiger, you're an actor, act. You know what I mean? And Steiger said, yeah. I will never forgive him for that. So cut to this time. It's me and Kenny. I'm going to take him down there. We said we're going to take him to, Rod, to see Rod, uh, Rod Steiger. My dad mm-hmm. goes, Rod Steiger. I did a live TV show with him once. We were playing opposing attorneys. My dad did a lot of live oh, TV wow. in New York. He goes, we're playing opposing attorneys. I go, yeah. And he goes, yeah. And every time the camera's on me, you know, every time it's my lines, I guess camera's on everybody. It was mm-hmm. you know, mostly a wide. He goes, every time they, it's my lines, start just doing this. Oh, really? And he goes, yeah. And, and then when it goes to him, he's not doing that. Only when it's on me. And I will never forgive him for that. <laughs> I was like, wait, didn't we just hear Steiger say that about Brando? Well, Funny. Yeah, uh, so then I spent my time at Playhouse West, which, which was great. And then I auditioned for the Active Studio, and uh, I passed that audition. It was, um, that, that was a, a feather on my cap. No one had passed for six months. I, it was legendary, you know. Mm. Um, I loved uh, the group theater and that Kazan and Pacino was uh, the president and Harvey Keitel and Ellen Bernstein were the presidents of, of it. So I studied with Shelley Winters while I was there and um, I was a working observer. How was she as a teacher? Crazy. I love, well, yeah, she's, <laughs> Passionate. A, she's a fucking nutcase, but that's why I want to know. How was she as a teacher? Here's a good story. It's, it's, she was a devotee of uh, Strasbourg, right? right? He was God to her. And the class was like four hours, and we'd only get through two monologues. She loved talking. She loved Italians. She loved talking about Marilyn. She loved talking about Tony Franciosa. Her, you know, she loved you if you were Italian. <laughs> so I got along really well with her. She'd come in. It was hot. It was during the summer, and she'd say, can I borrow your water? And she'd just pour it on her head like it was nothing. Water's dripping down her face, and she just continued talking. So we're doing monologues, right? And I was already doing this on my own. I didn't know it was a Strasbourg thing. I would use music to help me emotionally prepare. And this class was about doing monologues and using music for emotional preparation. So we do one, and then it was already time for a break, and then you do another. So I'm scheduled for, like, the sixth week. She talked to him afterwards, and if you said you studied Strasbourg, she'd light up. If you said Adler or Meisner, she'd make a face, <laughs> right? So six week, and I'm doing a, a monologue from Frankie and Johnny and the Claire de Lune. It's actually her monologue, but it's about the grandmother, and I had a close relationship with my grandmother. I'm listening to Ave Maria. Right before it's time for me to go, um, she asked the person, they studied Meisner, and she stops the class, and she turns to the class, and she says, listen. If you study Meisner, you'll be a good actor, but you'll never be a great actor. Tony, go prepare. By that point, I'm, I've only studied Meisner. So I'm back and I'm preparing and listening to my music. I come out and do the monologue. She leaps out of a chair and she goes, that's what I'm talking about. That's the work. That's the work. Tony, where did you study? I said, well, Shelley, I studied Meisner too. And she looks at me like I had betrayed her. Ah. She, was, <laughs> she was so sure I was going to say Strasbourg. She needs a comeback. She goes, well, it works for you. Next. Yeah. Yeah. So I love that passion. I love passionate people. And, you know, she's passionate, passionate about the work. Yeah. And then I got to study with Charlie Lawton, who was just great. Yeah. Was he in the wheelchair? He was in the wheelchair. And uh, here's a good story. I'm feeling pretty on top of my game, right? But I wanted other things. And was he teaching down in Larry Moss's area? No, he was teaching at the Rose Theater in Venice. So Larry Moss was down at the airport. Okay. Yeah. yeah but, at the Rose Theater in yeah, Venice. That's right. And I just loved his, his way. And we would do, you know, it was long for me to do the relaxation because we would do it for almost an hour and a half and it'd be like, oh. Right. And sense memory. So I'm feeling like a pretty good actor and we're doing sense memories. And the first thing you do is a, a cup of coffee. And we're going to do that for like an hour and a half. So I had this monkey mind at the time. It's like, it would bounce around. It's like hard to just focus on this cup. And then people around me are crying or laughing. And I'm thinking, come on, you're making it up. How do you get that from your cup of coffee? You've been watching Brian Lally, Hollywood Native. Now I want to talk to you about something I'm really passionate about, and that's teaching acting. So I co-founded Lola's Acting School with my son, Kyle Lally, Lally or Lally Acting School. 
I've been acting for a, a long time now of 100 plus credits on IMDb, hundreds of plays I've been involved with over the years. And I just want to share that experience with you. What we do differently here at Lola's is we give you practical advice that you can use on a movie set, on a play, an audition, anywhere. We give you the foundation to build yourself as a great actor. If you come to us, you don't know anything. We can teach you everything you need to know to be comfortable on a, on a set and to excel. Don't just listen to me. Look at what our students are doing. Daryl Wesley, who is writing on two hit shows, The Game and The Upshaws, and Ben Barrett, who is a series regular on The Politician, Megan Davis who is uh, playing Amber Heard in the Johnny Depp Amber Heard story. Come check us out. We're at the Historic Arc Theater in the NoHo Arts District. You ever want to try plant-based eating? I have. What, you're a little confused, overwhelmed, you don't know how to get started? Definitely. Well, there's a simple answer to that. Go to Debbie Chu's Chew on Vegan YouTube channel. Debbie Chu is a plant-based RN. I've known Debbie for over 38 years, and she's very good at what she does. You go to the channel, and there's 300, over 300, recipes. They're simple, easy to make, and they're delicious. If you want to try it, you just might get healthy. Give it a shot. Chew on vegan. And then uh, Charlie come over, he'd wheel over and say, how's it going, Tony? I said, I don't know, Charlie. I, I don't smell the coffee. I can't feel the heat. I can't feel the cup. Maybe, I don't know if I'm getting a swishing thing when I do this, but... I'm not getting it. And he said, well, it's not important that you get it, that you try. I'm thinking, okay, all right. It's my first one. Next week, I'm doing orange juice. How's it going, Tony? And people are laughing and emoting and like, I, but is there vodka in your orange juice? What are you, what's so funny? How's it going, Tony? I said, I don't know, Charlie. I can't feel the glass. I don't smell the orange juice. I'm, I'm not getting it. Well, it's not important that you get it, it's that you try. Well, this is going on now for weeks. Shower. Charlie, I can't feel the water. I don't feel the heat. Charlie, I don't feel the shaving cream. I can't feel the razor. And I'm thinking, I should have never come here. I'm feeling like I, I don't know anything about acting anymore. How is everybody getting it but me? It's about the sixth week, and we're doing wind. And I am getting it. I, I feel the wind on my face, on my arms. And I'm transported to fourth grade. I'm at Southeast Elementary. I'm flying a kite. And... I feel this freedom and I'm crying and Charlie comes over to me and says, how's it going, Tony? And through the tears, I'm like, Charlie, it's great. I'm, I'm like fourth grade. I'm flying a kite. I can feel the wind. And he says, well, it's not important that you get it. So you try. And I'm thinking to myself, fuck that. Don't tell me it's not important. I've been trying for six weeks. Don't say it's not important. Exercise is over. And I'm thinking, oh, shit. I still feel the wind. I I think I broke it. I think I went further. Not only do I feel the wind, I'm starting to get cold. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I roll it down my sleeves, and my neck is like, I go to crack my neck. And right above me is a circular fan <laughs> that somebody had turned on yeah. during the exercise. And now <laughs> I'm waiting around for Charlie. I said, Charlie, I got to apologize to you. I didn't create the wind. I didn't know there was a fan. Somebody turned on the <laughs> on the fan and he said it again you know you're not going to create the wind it's like getting in touch with the senses and just what does the exercise do to you well that was one of the best life lessons acting lessons i ever learned so charlie passed away a few years ago so i w went to the memorial and i wanted they said you know you'll be able to say something if you want to say something so i want to say thank you it was an important life lesson because i think for so much of my time especially early on as an actor i thought when i make it then i can have fun then i can relax not knowing what that's going to feel like if i get there but i am definitely not enjoying the journey <laughs> right yeah. i'm struggling and i think that's a part of it being an artist and struggling being like van gogh and um so I stand up at the memorial, it's at the actor's studio. I'm about to come in. Um, it's been going on for about a half hour. And then Pacino walks in and he sits right in front of uh, the, the, the stand where you're going to talk. And John Savage comes in. I love John Savage. There's no more room. So they got to put a chair on the stage. And Martin Sheen sits in, they got to put a chair on the stage. And Marty Landau's there. And when I had stood up, it squeaked. So everyone looks like, well, all right, who's next to, to speak? So I figured, fuck it. I'm just going to 
tell my story and I go down and tell this story. Well, I'm like a stand-up comedian. Pacino's in the in the front row laughing, hitting his knee. Everybody's hysterical. It's the perfect audience for it because they'd all been in some degree of that, right. you know, struggling with an exercise or whatever. And at the end, I was outside and Pacino came over to me and shook my hand and said, thanks for sharing that story. It was nice to hear that about Charlie. Yeah. Yeah. Man. So I've had great teachers, a great respect yeah. from the How work. How long did you study with Charlie? Two years. Did he teach the animal exercise? Yeah. 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 And there was one class where I had done the best work I had done. I worked on a, a play called Homefront. You sure, know it? Yeah, it's got this great monologue. Jeremy's got this great Do monologue. I know it? Who the fuck are you talking yeah. about? Yeah. <laughs> this great scene with my sister. Right. And um, I had just done it. It was probably, for me, it felt like the best work I'd ever done and just sat down. And maybe. Four minutes before the well, the next scene is sitting up, somebody comes in late and sits behind me, and Charlie goes, hey, Al. And I hear, hey, Charlie, it's Pacino. And it's like, motherfucker, he couldn't get here 20 minutes earlier and see me work? Yeah. I love Pacino's passion. I love his passion for the stage and the film and, and just doing the work. First film, I, I, I wrote a short film called Seeing Pacino. Mm -hmm. I got to go back to my mother. My first script was called The Cleaners. It's a black comedy. And I, I was telling my mom, I thought Pacino or De Niro would be great for it if I can ever get it to them. So I had sent my mother a copy of the script. She's going to the see, um, oh, which was it? What was the last Shakespeare? Uh, Merchant of Venice. So she's going to see Merchant of Venice. And she goes, um, Anthony, I'm going to bring you a script, see if I could give it to him. I said, Ma, you're probably not going to be able to give him my script, so she sees what the barrier is when he comes out. So she, she's an older woman, so they let her get right up front. Pacino comes out, and my mother goes, Al, Al. He turns around, and she goes, could you come here, please? So Pacino goes over to my mother, and she, she gives him the script. She goes, my son wrote this. The following week, my mother calls, did Pacino call you? I said, no, ma, he didn't call. I, you know, he's the chance, he probably gets a million scripts. She goes, I, I gave it to him. I, I told him he wrote it. I said, you know me, scripts he must skip. Thank you. I love it. A few years later, another play. She takes the script again. <laughs> yeah. Al, Al. She comes over to her. She goes, I gave it to you before, but here, my, my, my son wrote it. Next week, did he call you? I said, no, my, he, he, he never called. I guess it was 2018 or 2019, he was doing a screening of Salome. My mom was out here. Me, Matthew, and my mom went. So he's doing a Q&A, and he's doing it for about 20 minutes, and my mom's hand goes up. Oh, gosh. Right? Yeah. So she's raising her hand, and I'm looking at her like, what are you going to do? And his manager or whatever kept saying, Al, you got to do one more. And my mother's like the next one, they stop right before her. So I, at the end of it, I said, Mom, what were you going to ask him? She goes, I was going to ask him. I gave you two of my son's scripts. <laughs> Did you ever read them? <laughs> this is Anthony's right here. Yeah. <laughs> She sounds mm. oh, she was amazing. Supportive, yeah, yeah, great support. Yeah. So when you're out here, how are you? You're working at the school and doing extra work. Well, I was working as a waiter for most most of that time. Okay. So I worked as a waiter and doing extra work, you know, in in hopes to get my SAG card. Mm -hmm. Then I eventually get my SAG card, but the first line I ever got was on Cagney and Lacey. Hmm. So I was sitting with some friends and talking during lunch, and Tyne Daly walks by and she hears me. She goes, where in New York are you from? Bronx? I said, yeah. She goes, oh, I'm from the Bronx. John's from the Bronx. Why don't you come sit with us? Oh. Yeah. So I go sit with them and the other extras are looking at me like, well, how come he gets to go sit over there? So she says, how, how's it going for you? I said, well, you know, it's tough. You know, it's, it's hard to get a line in anything. And, you know, um, she goes, and the scene they were doing was like her and her husband's 15th wedding anniversary. They go into the favorite restaurant and I always hung around the camera, hoping to get a silent bit or hoping to get upgraded and get Taft Hartley. She goes, well, and I'm supposed to be the son of the owner, and they say hello to me, but I don't say anything back. She goes, well, I think you should have a line in this. It makes sense. So she calls over one of the PA. She says, would you get the director? I think Tony should have a line. So mm -hmm. we bring the director over and says, what's going on, Tiny? She goes, I want Tony to have a line. It makes sense. He would have a line. We're coming here for 15 years. We know the owner's son. We say hi to him. He would speak to us. 
And he says, yeah, it's a great, but, you know, it's another setup and we got to get out of here. Now the producer comes over. He goes, hey, what's going on? <laughs> and she goes, I think it makes sense in this grip for Tony to have a line. He goes, no, Tony, it does make sense, but it means another setup. She says, if it's about the money, I'll go in my trailer. I'll, I'll pay him. I'll write the check. And they said, no, no, you're right. It does make more sense. Uh, how fucking cool yeah. is it when the big time people step up? Yeah. yeah. So I didn't have the money to go home that year. Everyone else was going back to New York right. for Christmas, and that gave me the money mm -hmm. to go back for and Christmas. So I want you to tell me about what you learned, because I just started teaching the animal exercise. Mm -hmm. I want to say last week, but, you know, I've been shut down since COVID, so two years ago. And I, I, anyway, tell me about Lawton, because I've heard about Lawton teaching the animal exercise. It's important to me. Mm -hmm. What do you remember about it? Is there any, yeah. anything? Yeah, and, I, and I used it once for myself. You know, we would go and study the animal, you know, go to the zoo or, or, and, and really study the animal and really become the animal and then kind of humanize it, you know? Gotcha. You start off as the animal, and, and, you know, if you walked in on that class and you're auditing that class, that would be one of the classes where you say, what the fuck is going on here? Yeah. It looks like a bunch of lunatics. Yeah. But it was really cool. And, you know, with technique, is there if you need it, right? If you have an innate feel for something yeah. and it works. So let me get specific. A lot of times people are bringing in monologues that don't match the animal. Mm. Right. Yeah. This is. I mean. So I've heard from people from Charlie Lawton's class. Never studied with him. Mm -hmm. He came to see a play at Playhouse once. Mm -hmm. He came to see Winter in the Spring that I was in, which was nice. But he was in the wheelchair. I don't think he was feeling good. Mm -hmm. But you know. So I'm. I'm asking you about matching monologues with the animal because I've seen it done properly. I've taught it. Mm -hmm. I didn't do it properly. I've just seen people do it. It was kind mm -hmm. of magic to me. Mm -hmm. when it all works out. Did you have that experience with it? Well, I was working on it. I had always wanted to do Danny and Deep Blue Sea, so I right. started playing with it with that because I thought, there's a guy, he's broken. He's been beat up. He's beat up people. He's constantly fighting. He's broken. So I was doing an ape and, you know, you know, and and just kind of grunting with the monologue, right, and just kind of doing it. And, you know, I would do it as the ape you know it was all about finding behavior right and then maybe by the next week or during the week i'd be working on it and i'll kind of get it at it you know but i would still there was an intensity like in the gorilla's eyes like you know that when he looked at you he was like i am not fucking with this thing right mm -hmm. you know this thing is i don't know what it's thinking but it's it's ferocious Mm -hmm. You know, it's frightening. So that was one of the things I walked away from, you know, that when I looked, I mean, I was really looking, you know, deep into you. Or if, you know, I would take that out into bars or whatever. It's like I was going to get in a fight with you. What, you know, what am I going to do first and, you know, to, to protect myself? Mm -hmm. And then I did it. I was working with Eunice on a short film and uh, that I, I had written. my wife in the uh last night in yeah Patrick. Eunice Olsen nice lady wonderful actor from yeah. uh Singapore um and I was a child molester so I went back and studied the the apes again too but I walked away with something different you know I figured this guy is his time in prison has been really he's been beat he's been raped he's been you know just tore up he's broken and there was an old gorilla I was watching and and it was more of the heaviness in the shoulders that I focused on Mm -hmm. you know and how i held myself and then you know with all those exercises it was a matter of then taking it into life to to have that behavior you know to, to so it became second nature yeah so the first time i used the gorilla for danny it was more eventually what i held on to was that thing in the eyes and really looking at somebody you know um mm -hmm. and the second time i used it was for a different character, different reason, and I walked away with something different physical, you know, gotcha. a character trait that I don't possess. Mm -hmm. But from working on that, I was able to take that with me. That comes out of Meisner? Uh, no, Strasbourg. It came out of Strasbourg, gotcha. yeah. I realized after many years that as much as I love Meisner, and, and, and I think it's the foundation 
taught right, it should be the foundation of all acting. Yeah, I agree. But uh, Strasburg had a lot of good exercises. And, uh, you know, so that's why I started teaching it, because I think Uta Hagen has good exercises. Yeah. So Check off. And check off. Not sure I get him. I'm There's only one I use. Yeah. The psychological gesture. Yeah. And it's great if you're directing. I mean, the way I interpret it and the way I use it, mm -hmm. right? Like if a, a psychological gesture, if you're working on a character, right? It, it's getting it in your body. So you, you, everyone's doing it at the same time, right? And I like to take a picture of them when they're doing it. So the actor could see the difference. So the, the first, so like say I'm doing Danny in the Deep Blue Sea, mm -hmm. right? You're going to exaggerate it in physically, right? So the first thing you do is the you that you present to the world. So the you that I present to the world as Danny is like ready to fight and like angry and like, you know, and then hold that position for a while. Mm -hmm. And then you like let it go and you shake it off and, you, you know, I like to walk and move with it. And then now you're going to show the you that nobody sees. And then for me, my Danny was like almost in the fetal position, just, you know, and I was, I, I got in the, like the fetal position, you know, and I got very emotional when I got down like that. For me, it bookends everything between that and that is possible for this character, you know, yeah. you know, so a lot of times when I have someone, if they're working on a scene and I have them do the psychological gesture, there's not much difference between the you that they present to the world and the you that nobody sees. It's why they're pretty much one note for the whole time. They haven't explored all the possibilities, all the choices. They haven't broken down the script mm -hmm. enough. They've got a general idea. So I like using it like that. And like I say, it's a great tool to help point out to the actor too, because I'll take a, now it's easy because you, you phone camera on you and so you see how there's not much difference. Mm -hmm. Of course there is. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, working this way, the combination of everything, our work is just much more layered. Definitely. I think the audience waiting to get in to uh, see us is getting restless. Yeah, so. yeah. <laughs> so when and why did you start teaching? That came as an accident in 1987. After I left the playhouse, right, I, I didn't have a place to go. So I was, and I had, I was at the actor studio and um, I wanted to find a place like the actor studio because I was a working observer, so I can work if I worked with a member. So it wasn't enough for me. So then I wanted to have it like uh, Playhouse West. So I got some active friends together and said, why don't we get together, read plays and work on plays. We'll set it up like that. We can all moderate. We'll have it on Wednesday nights from uh, 7 to 10 and Saturdays 9, 9 to 12. That lasted for about maybe five months, that version of it. Then one, my friend Kathy says, Tony, it's all over the place. you got to teach. I said, I'm not going to teach. You know, I subscribe to the whole Woody Allen thing. Those who do, do. Those who can't do, teach. Yeah. And those who can't do anything, teach Jim. And I would have thought 10 years sooner, probably. If I didn't think that, because Bob had, had written me a letter. I have the letter about mm -hmm. starting to teach. Mm -hmm. And I said the same thing. But you know who one of my teachers was? Goldblum. Oh, really? Goldblum yeah, yeah, yeah. is fucking teaching. Yeah. He's a consummate fucking actor. Yeah, yeah. And I'm saying, I don't want to teach because I'm an actor. And he's taught me so many simple things as, you know, and he never stops acting. No. He's a teacher. But anyway, so that's what I thought. And it's stupid. No, and I had stupid. told... Uh, for me. I'm not saying, you know, for me, it was stupid. No, it was stupid for me, too, because I thought we're only able to wear one hat. I can call myself an actor. I can't call myself everything. Although I told Meisner when, because um, I got to study with him at Playhouse West, and then we all got to sit with him, and I told him that, you know, I, how much I wanted to act. I didn't think writing at the time, but I thought I might someday teach. Mm -hmm. And then he wrote me a nice note, gave it to me. And um, it did need direction because it was too chaotic and i f found that i kind of fell right into it and plus i wanted to just be real i didn't want to see acting mm -hmm. and it became great so over about a 12 year period with my group i called it the artist theater group artist because that's what i aspired to be group because i love the, the stories of the group theater and theater because i love theater and in about a 12 year period i put up 90 plays and lost money on 89 of them <laughs> So I was $65,000 in debt from doing these plays, but I was only looking to act. Yeah. 
I sold my car one time to do Danny in the Deep Blue Sea. You know, and I bought a cheaper car, which ended up in the long run costing me way more money. But it gave me, uh, you know, that place didn't exist, so I started it. And, and I really found that I was passionate about teaching. Where was that at? First, I rented the Chamber Theater, where I had classes with Bob at okay. one point. Before we had a place on Lancashire, right. we worked out at a, a like rec center in North Hollywood off of Vineland, I think, by the park. And he was using the Chamber Theater. Right. So I knew that place was available, so I asked the Chamber Theater, and I, I worked. I was there for about 12 years until they sold the the place and then it was downtown had a great sp with uh, with mike, michael mike beavis yeah yeah so it's down there spot. oh man i'm so sorry i didn't take it over you know well no, that place is still there i thought they were going to tear it down and build a high it, rise or something because mike was living there what a spot what yeah. a bohemian spot oh yeah it was yeah. great I, I was down there recently because a friend it's all different down there but yeah. that building's for sale a building is yeah yeah what I make off this podcast. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Buy, buy it. Building. Yeah. But then I just started teaching and never really making a great living at it, you know. But then I've, I, I started teaching for a lot of different people, you know. So I always liked knowing I had a paycheck coming and then doing my own thing where I didn't have to answer to anybody. Mm -hmm. So then I went on in October 16th. Uh, 2000 my son was born and we were going through a divorce and um, I already told you I had a shit father so I wanted to do this right so I dropped my agent and my manager uh, my ex-wife was a school teacher so we had medical there so I would pick up my son every morning 5 o'clock and drop him to her at 4.30 and then I would look to wait tables and then eventually started teaching when he got in preschool at 4 then I started teaching during the day and was able to open up my schedule a little bit more and then when he was in school i was able to work my schedule around that uh, around my son yeah i find myself dealing with self-doubt and fears when it comes to art and acting in general did you i'm sure you face that but what would you say to anyone who's like tiptoeing along the line of jumping in so. i would say jump in yeah <laughs> i would say i say there's no time to tiptoe yeah to jump in because i think that's all a part of art you got to get in there and start to stumble mm -hmm. it's never perfect and along that stumble you discover things you would not have discovered mm -hmm. you know when i was in new york doing my one-man show out of the darkness into the light we're doing it in this theater now all these covid restrictions come in so we find out Everyone's got to be masked. Everyone's got to show proof. And then during my dress rehearsal, they come and say, listen, the doors have to be open. The windows have to be open. You can't close the curtains. So we thought the dress rehearsal is right outside the theater is a playground. And you hear all these kids laughing and, and, and everyone was upset. And I said, no, no, this is great. I'm going to use that. If they're out there tomorrow night, it's right at the moment where I'm talking to God or the universe. I'm going to say, um, I hear children out there who are they and now the voice says those are the voices of the children who were never born because of people like you mm -hmm. which is i've attempted suicide in the play so by being flexible by being in the moment by not ha having it be so precious it allows you to find moments you would never find mm -hmm. i ask my students i like to ask who here is a perfectionist and usually a bit good half the class or almost half the class hands go up like it's a a badge of honor and i say that's just another word for procrastinator yeah <laughs> yeah you know it yeah. sounds very noble yeah. to say yeah i'm a perfectionist yeah, yeah. but i'm a really procrastinator. you're a procrastinator yeah yeah, yeah david's a perfectionist yeah yeah, yeah because you, big time perfection yeah yeah because it's you know that's you know a, that's a part perfect of it of his yeah. well of any of us <laughs> yeah of any of us. Yeah, I'm trying to break through that wall. You just got to break through. It's bullshit. It's a protective device. Mm -hmm. You know, if I never put myself out there, I never have to be judged. Yeah. I don't give a shit. During the pandemic, right, I thought, I've been doing my own stuff for so long. I haven't worked on anyone else's material. I should do that. So I challenged myself for 52 weeks. I did 52 monologues. 
And I kept posting it, so I had to have it done by Monday and ready to go, or so I'm going to look pretty stupid. Mm -hmm. And even uh, next Saturday, auditioning for the actor studio again. Nice. So I told you I was a member of the actor studio, right? Mm -hmm. So that was supposed to be for life as a working observer. Four years into it, I decide, you know what? I've been here a long time. I'm just going to take my final being a regular member. My scene partner, four days before my audition, got hepatitis, had to go in the hospital. So I call another friend. They said, will you do my audition with me? Well, I ended up failing the audition, and it meant I had to start all over again. So I was really pissed off at the place. I was like, you got to be kidding me. I work more here than anybody. Obviously, something went off with this audition. You're going to fail me? So in 1996, I decided to do it again, right? And uh, I auditioned, and I get a call back. I said, how the fuck did I get a call back? You either pass or fail. Why are they giving me a call back? Why are they making it so hard? Well, one of the people on the, on the jury was this actress that I like, teacher that I heard all my friends were studying with, named Susan Peretz. And she had seen me in at least five plays over the years and always made it a point to, to say nice things to me. So I call my friend Jimmy and I say, Jimmy, do me a favor. Ask Susan if I can um, study with her on scholarship. I have no money. And she says, oh, yeah, I'd love to, Anthony, Tony, to work with me. So in September of 96, I started studying with Susan, who teaches Strasbourg. In December of 96, this brunette with green eyes comes in. And I think, oh, shit. I better ask if she wants to do a scene before everybody else gets here, <laughs> right? Because to offset what I was getting, I would go in and like unlock the theater or sweep up and that stuff. So I said, hi, I'm Anthony. She says, hi, I'm Joel. I said, you have a scene partner? No, not yet. Well, I'll work with you if you want. January, we start dating. March, we get engaged. May, we get married of 97. So if I didn't fail that audition at the actor studio, I don't meet her. I'm not in that place. And I don't have my son, which is the greatest part of my whole life. Yeah. So my friend said to me, because they only called me, you have to apply and it takes like six months, maybe a year. So I had sent in an application, I think, in 2019, and then COVID hit. So I just find out Monday, okay, um, you can audition uh, next Saturday uh, if you still want your spot. So, so I said, yeah, I'll take it right now. I don't have a scene partner. I don't know what play I'll be doing, but I want the spot. I'm thinking about what scenes, and a lot of the scenes I'm thinking about, it's like, oh, shit. I still like those scenes, but no, I'm too old for those scenes. It's, gonna, it's not going to read right. And I find a scene with a, a, a woman, and I call an actor friend from Charlie's class, actually. And I said, you want to audition with me for the studio? It will be your audition, too. Oh, yeah, when is it? Next Saturday. Next Saturday. I don't know. Next Saturday, she goes, aren't you worried it's too quick? I said, no, I'm not worried it's too quick. I don't care what happens. It's an opportunity to act. Mm -hmm. It's an opportunity for me to get on stage. It just matters that you try. Yeah, and I told you what happened last time I failed. I got married and got a kid out of it. I can't wait to see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. But it's just about for me, and I think probably for you too, Brian, it, It's I just love doing the work. Yeah. I just want to do the work. So it's an opportunity. I'm not paying to get up on stage. It's not costing me money. Mm -hmm. It's a piece I'd like to play with, and I get a chance to do my thing. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. yeah that's great. So jump in, man. There's no time to, to tiptoe. Yes, sir. Yeah. That, that, that should be my that should be my autobiography, right? Yeah. No time to tip no tiptoe. No time to jump yeah. in, no time to tiptoe. Why are you looking at me? We got yeah. some things. We, we have some things that are really really good seriously they're good and uh he hasn't put them out there because he's tiptoeing so yeah, yeah that's just wasting time uh, so let's talk about the day you got fired and your whole world literally as you said the whole world opened up so in i think it was 2016 now so i've been teaching at the new york film academy for um nine years at this point and there's interest in um, my second film. So I really want to have time to work on the film. And they encourage you, the New York Film Academy, to work in the field that you teach. So I teach acting, so I go off and work. So I asked, before I did anything, I said to my son, I said, Matthew, I'm thinking 
of taking a semester off to shoot my film. If I do, money's going to be really tight because I have no money coming in for four months. I'm not going to get paid for this film. In fact, I'm putting money into this film. And he goes, I think you should go for it, Dad. I think it'd be good for you. It's like, I don't have to answer to nobody else. So I asked, can I take a semester off? I said, oh, yeah, of course. So I started thinking, right, I cannot not work for four months, and I've never been able to survive just off my own classes. Where in the world would I want to go? Maybe there's a Rome Film Academy. Not. Maybe a Madrid Film Academy. Not. Maybe a Paris Film Academy. There is. In fact, I get a hold of a woman. She's in Santa Monica looking to bring a teacher to Paris to do a workshop. So we meet. She comes and sits in on my class, and she goes, okay, I'm not looking anymore. We make an agreement that I'm going to go to Paris in two months and teach a two-week workshop. Never did that before. I called a friend in Berlin. I said, listen, I'm going to go to Paris and do a, a workshop. If you could set up a workshop for me in Berlin, I'll come to Berlin first. He sets it up. So I have eight people in Berlin. In my class in Berlin, I have this famous singer from Stockholm. And um, at that time that I was in Berlin, Larry Moss was there doing a workshop. Ivana Chubbuck was there doing a workshop. So at the end of it, I said, you know, there's some really famous acting teachers here. Ivana Chubbuck, Larry Moss. She goes, oh, I know. I said, what made you come to me? She said, I was in my yoga class, and I was talking to my yoga instructor, and I said, I wanted to take an acting class. And she said, oh, my favorite acting teacher is doing a workshop in Berlin. I had had it years ago at the New York Film Academy. I'm flying home, and I'm thinking, man, life has never been this great. I've never had a period in my life where everything has gone great. My friend George Russo, I had lent him my car where he was gone. He picks me up. It takes us two hours to find where he was walked us. But I'm, I'm good. It's like, that's okay, George. Don't worry about it. I drop him off in Hollywood. It's about 1030. I'm hungry. I go to Wendy's on Sunset to get something to eat. I just give the guy a 20 and I hear, get the fuck out of the car. I'll kill you. I go, what's going on? The guy's talking to me. I look for help at the Wendy's guy. He's locking himself in the in. The guy's got a button down shirt. He's tweaking on something. He goes, get the fuck out of the car. I'll kill you. He pulls his shirt open, the buttons bounce off my window, and I'm like, the, how the fuck did I invite this into my life? I've never been feeling more positive. He runs around, goes to the front of my car, he bounces the hood, he goes, get the fuck out of the car, I'll fucking kill you, motherfucker. I roll up my window, he comes, slaps the glass, he goes, get the fuck out of the car. I go, don't break my glass, he goes, then get the fuck out of the car. The guy behind me thinks I'm taking too long, he beeps, the guy looks at me and goes, I'll kill you too, motherfucker. He goes after yeah. the other car. I hear a horn beep. I hear the guy's voice trailing off. I'll kill you too. Yeah. I'm like, what the They're gonna fuck get happened? Get out with your black belt. No, uh, I'm not doing it with this guy. He's <laughs> he's not going to pay attention. Yeah. I tell the guy, all right, give me my change. He's gone. I'm driving home thinking, I feel like I'm responsible for something. How did I invite this into my life? I had a roommate at the time. I was going to be gone for a month, so I signed a bunch of checks, left stamps. I said, Larry, when my mail comes in, will you pay my bills? Half my mail is on the table, not opened. So I go wake him up. And I said, Larry, what's with my mail? Why, why didn't you? He goes, oh, you wanted me to open all your mail? I said, no, I wanted to be late on half my bills. What sense does it make that you only open part of them? I said, you know what I don't want to talk about? I'm going to go take a shower. He goes, Tony. He goes, uh, that's the other thing. I said, what's the other thing? I walk into my bathroom, and while I was gone, a pipe broke. So the, all the sheetrock is down in the toilet, in the sink. He doesn't even bother to, to clean it out. In the tub, it's not his bathroom. And it's like, you couldn't clean it out? And it smells like mildew. Now I'm thinking, what the fuck is going on? I had, I had three jobs at the time. I had my own class. I had 16 students. And I had paid a friend to teach my class while I was gone. I go to my class. I got two students. Where's everybody? They didn't, they didn't like uh, the substitute. So now I got to start all over and build that class. I got no students. I was teaching for Franco. And I get a call, Tony, we got good news, bad news. I said, well, what's the good news? James got a, a space. Great, what's the bad news? Well, we had to combine some of the classes. You don't have any classes this month, but you'll have classes next month. The next day, I get fired from the New York Film Academy. They lied. They had a way of, once you hit a certain pay scale, the way they got rid of you is they don't put you back on the schedule. Mm -hmm. So now I got no jobs. Somebody threatened to kill me. I'm late on my bills. The sky has fallen. I'm going to Santa Monica to, to visit my son. I said, Matthew, I don't know what has happened, but I've lost all my jobs. He goes, you'll be okay, Dad. It's a five and a half hour drive. I'm driving on the 101, and I'm thinking, what is going on? 
And then it's probably only seconds, but because what I'm seeing happening as I'm driving on the 101, it's, it's impossible, but it's happening. And I see a canoe flying towards my car. And I'm like, that's a canoe. <laughs> I, I hit my brakes. The canoe bounces in front of me. I go off the, the freeway to the left. The canoe bounces and goes to the right. It wasn't really busy. Cars skid. These guys get out, move this 15, 18-foot canoe to the side. I'm a wreck. I can't stop shaking. I'm thinking, okay, I feel like I'm kind of spiritual or I'm kind of in tune with things. What does this mean? So I think it means I'm going to die, that I'm not going to see it coming. When it happens, it's going to be quick. So I start up my car and start driving. I'm thinking, okay, if I'm going to die, what do I need to tie up? So I think my mother's going to be upset because I haven't talked to my sister Donna in about 14 years. But Donna's difficult. She don't talk to my other two sisters or my brother either. Donna might be upset. We we talked. I, we never talked again. And I died like that. I got this friend I haven't spoke to in a while. She got sick. She lost a lot of weight. I thought I was giving her space. I haven't talked to her in a while. So I call my sister Donna. I haven't talked to her in all this time. I say, hey, Donna. She goes, Anthony? I said, yeah, listen. It's been a long time. I love you. Why don't we just go from here? So we make up. She says a lot of things I don't agree with, but I'm not looking to start. I'm just like, all right, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then uh, I said, I better call Michael, tell him I made up with Donna. I call up Michael and say, hey, I, I made up with Donna. He goes, why? I said, well, I think I'm going to die. He goes, why are you sick? I said, no, I never felt better. He goes, why do you think you're going to die? And I tell him what I just told you. He goes, Anthony, I don't think that means you're going to die. I said, just know when it happens, I'm okay with it. If you could be a presence in Matthew's life, he goes, yeah, but I don't think you're going to die. I said, just know when it happens, I'm okay. I better call Diane and Tina now. I called Diane. Um, I, ma I made up with Donna. Why? I think I'm going to die. <laughs> she goes through almost the same routine. I went through with Michael, Tina, the same thing. I call my mother. I don't tell my mother I think I'm going to die, but she right. cries anyway because right. I made up with Donna. I call my friend a couple of days after I'm back. I, I meet her, I have lunch. As I'm driving away from her, I'm thinking, I don't think I'm going to die anymore. And I thought, that sucks. <laughs> I'm all ready to go. I'm not ready to start over. I have no idea where to begin. You know, I'm 57. I don't, I, I don't want to start this all over again. And I pissed off at the New York Film Academy, so I put it out on Facebook, what had happened. Next week, I get a call from Istanbul. Tony, if I put a class together in Istanbul, would you come teach it? So if you put it together, I'll come teach it. Uh, Johannesburg. If I put a class together, and then that starts happening all over the world. 15 countries later, being fired from the New York Film Academy, and me deciding to put it out there to the world, the whole world opened up. And I, I had been going, um, and then also my, uh, you know how colleges come to high schools to try to recruit students? Mm -hmm. Someone came from the Academy of Art University in San Francisco. He says, Dad, why don't you apply to this school in San Francisco? I said, I don't think they're going to hire me. I live in LA, but I'm thinking, all right, they'll put me closer to you. Maybe I'll move to San Francisco. An, an actress named Diane Baker, you was sure, remember, of course. She ran the acting department and decides to hire me. They're going to fly me up, put me up at the Sir Francis Drake Hotel. And that becomes my life for these past years. I would fly up uh, on Mondays, do two classes, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. They'd fly me back, uh, teach my own class on Thursdays. And then Januarys, I would travel overseas. And three months in the summer, I'd be overseas. Right. And I got to take my son to Korea with me to teach to Berlin, to London, to Liverpool. Sir Francis Drake, is that where Fatty Arbuckle? Um, he, he might have. I, it was overlooking there. Union Square. It was just oh, yeah, yeah. great old. We filmed, we filmed uh, the Fatty Arbuckle story. Oh, did you? Was Fatty Arbuckle, yeah, in the, Sir Fan in the room where the woman died. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah, it's a great, great, so, great hotel. I got to work with a bondage queen. Oh, <laughs> She yeah. was drunk. She said, you get into your character. Oh, Jesus. And I'll get into mine. I was like, cool. And she goes, don't put the bottle up too hard. 
He's like, okay, uh, honey. Yeah, I had to shove a bottle up, which I ended up not doing. I don't know why. I was just, they had, a, they had porn people around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This guy was like, yeah, I'll do it. And so he came there with a bottle and he's, uh, he's jabbing her with it. Oh, uh, like, Jesus. Yeah. Yeah, but I've come to the point in my life, too, especially after my son was born, that I have no idea what's in the best, my best interest. There was nothing in my life that I had planned out that worked out the way I thought. So now I'm at a point in my life where I, I still put my boat in the water. I set sail in the direction I want to go. But when I get blown off course, I know there's something for me to learn. There's something for me to do there. Mm -hmm. And then just keep doing my own thing. So I'm not waiting for anybody to give me an opportunity to act or write or, or whatever. You know, up until recently. You know, I put up my one-man show again. You know, and it's a roll of the dice. I mean, I'm responsible for $1,000. Yeah. You know, they took a page out of stand-up comics, right? I got, you know, I hate that part of this whole thing. I hate always having to get on, but I have to do what I have to do so I can do what I want to do, which is get on stage. So I end up, you know, trying to, you know, get people to come to my classes or get people to come to my shows. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Do you, uh, when you're writing, are you on, are you more writing on a set schedule or are you more inspired at a certain moment to write? I'm, I always keep in my back pocket a, a, a notebook, mm -hmm. you know, if I have an idea or something, this is a new one, so there's nothing in there. I'll write it down. You know, I've got 11 other screenplays that I want to do, but what I'm, I pivoted, um, now during the pandemic and be my, my show deals with suicide and being, I survived a suicide attempt. I started seeing all the people that were committing suicide. So what I'm trying to do now with my, my play is I want to take it to colleges. I want to do it on their stage and involve their theatrical people. And then I want to do the Q&A involve their mental health people so that the students know exactly where to go. Since I've been doing that film and this, I've got six people that when they've been suicidal, they've called me. And I've been able to talk them down and to help them get help so that's with very few people seeing any of these projects i can only imagine if more people see it mm -hmm. you know and the thing is i'm not an actor on stage portraying a guy who you know um you know someone who's really danced on the tracks yeah you know my story is not everybody's story but it is a story and then people react to that just you, you being authentic and just showing your life spread out warts and all and my story is not like anybody else's story, but I put put it out there. It's also about how we change. We're meant to change. And I see also how forgiving people are, too, if you own something. You're like, I mean, I'm telling the worst of me. I'm talking about, you know, you know, I would pick acting classes that had the most women. You know, it was all about those 2000 going out on ladies' night uh, with my friends who live in the house. And... We tell them we're actors, and we, we're good friends with Pacino and Travolta, and we're having a party Saturday night. Come, come. And then when they get there, we said, at 9 o'clock, we said, no, we said 7 o'clock. They're gone now. <laughs> <laughs> you just missed them. Yeah. You didn't see a limousine as you pulled out? Because yeah. Pacino's an early arriver. Yeah, but there's a lot of stories that are, are, are pretty shitty, you know, uh, that I, you know, done. I talk about, you know, robbing a hooker, mm -hmm. robbing a drive-in. You know, it was, and, just, it was just for her condoms. Yeah. <laughs> but I think if you're earnest and, and you, you, you're not that person anymore and people, you know, accept it, yeah. you know, that you owned it. But it's also, there's nobody out there that doesn't have their own shit, you know, Yeah. except not everybody lays it out on stage. Yeah. No, that's amazing. You're doing that for, I had an uncle pass away from suicide about three years ago so i'm oh, sorry it's, uh, yeah it's incredible that you're using using your art for that yeah so that's one thing i want to do with it the other is during the pandemic i saw all these stand-up comedians that you never heard of before and there's a pretty good stand-up show on hulu called in and of its no yeah in and of itself in and of itself and the guy did the show off broadway for about 500 shows so he got the attention of stephen colbert as a producer and it's about identity and he breaks the fourth wall too he talks to the audience 
So I know there's an audience for it. So I'd love to get the money to shoot it with three properly and then try to sell it to Hulu or Netflix because there's people over the seas who are struggling, you know, that don't have that yeah. ability to, you know, s see someone speak like this, Yeah, you know, and maybe get help. Definitely. You know? Yeah. If we can help in any way, I think that'd be great. Who are you offering me? Yeah. yeah. You were we're a package these days. <laughs> I don't know. Fort Orange, Port Orange. Port Orange. Port Orange, Florida. Or Hollywood yeah, Native. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> Anthony Montez, it's been a pleasure. Always Brian, look, thanks for thinking of me. Always look forward to getting coffee with you. Yes. Always give me an idea how to get students. Never never hold on to anything for yourself. You're a very generous man. And, uh, thank you. And I appreciate your, your time today. Before we go, uh, Tony, is there anything you want to promote? Uh, website, book, social media? Oh, yeah. You know, if you're looking for me, um, you can find me on anthonymontes.com. Um, and I have my books. There's a link to my 22 books that I've published. They're, 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 they're mainly plays, but also I do these morning writings you know, uh, every morning for the last 3,016 days, the first thing I do when I wake up in the morning is write a letter to myself. And it's been one of the most positive things I've ever done for myself. I used to keep a journal and write at the end of the day, and all I did was reflect on everything that went wrong, and then that's what I'm going to sleep with. But, and, and it's during this time that all these huge changes have happened because it's changed my whole mindset. It's been now when I wake up, it's anything is possible day. So it's within those times that I did those films, within those times that I've traveled to all these countries, within those times that I've been putting up my one-man show. You can also find me at um, themontezmethod.com. And, um, yeah, if, uh, if you have an opportunity to see my one-man show, please come out and see it. I'm always looking to for a place, a theater, to do it. And I want to travel overseas and domestically with it as well. And that information will be on your website. It will yeah. be updated all the time. Yeah, yeah. Because you're pretty good at keeping shit up. Well, it's out of necessity, you know. It's sink or swim. Yeah. So I'm doing the dog paddle yeah. through life. <laughs> I think that's going to be the name of your book. <laughs> yeah. Doing the dog paddle yeah, yeah. through life.